Welcome to Ironwood. We are excited to worship with you on this wonderful Sunday. We want to let you know that there are lots of exciting things coming up in 2024 and we want you to stay connected. So make sure that you have our Church Center app downloaded to your phone where you can stay up to date with all the events happening in our church and also in the Indiana District. Solo queremos invitarlos al servicio que tenemos en español todas las semanas e invitarlos los domingos a las 10 de la mañana tenemos también servicio en español en Iglesia Iron Good Pentecostal Unida. Just only I have to say you guys invited to the Spanish service on Thursday at 7 o'clock and Sunday is cool um, in English. Uh, we have to traduction in Spanish too. Tenemos traductores en español para cada uno de ustedes que quieran compartir con nosotros. Indiana District Men's Conference and Ladies Conference is coming up very soon and we want to let you know that we have put those links to register on the Church Center app. Registration is open and the tickets are selling so if you are interested in going go ahead and get your ticket today on the Church Center app. February the 11th our Ironwood Student Ministries will be having a bake sale in the front lobby. This will be a Valentine's themed bake sale and we want you to bring some cash and come support our student ministries. February the 16th, our Ironwood students and hyphen and anyone who would like to join us, you're welcome to join us at Ironworks Ice Skating Rink in Mishawaka. Bring some money to pay for your skates and join us for a night of fellowship. Meet us there at 615. All of our Kids Zone parents and families, we want to let you know that there is a Holy Ghost Children's Rally taking place in Elkhart on February the 10th at 2 p.m. We are so thankful for everything that God is doing right here in Ironwood and in our community. We want to thank you for being a part of our service today. Let's go ahead and stand. Service is going to start right now. Praise the Lord, church. Psalm 63, 1 through 3 says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for your presence in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. I'm so thankful that God, week after week, continues to show up and meet us here in the sanctuary. And in the middle of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, my sister-in-law, Tori, received a message Monday night at 10.47 p.m. where the Lord stepped into her life. And when the Lord steps in, he brings everything you need, healing, power, and victory. His arm is not short. So tonight, I just want to praise him a little bit. Worship with us as we sing. Be 
Salt, Amen. Is having surgery. Uh, she wants. Uh, would like to be prayed for. We pray for Zora Salt upcoming surgery. Kelly Rainforth, Amen. So Brother Sean's mom uh, fell and broke a vertebrae in her back. So we're gonna pray that God would touch and heal Kelly Rainforth. Hector Garcia, Amen. Says Miner's father. He needs healing. Amen. So want to pray for that. Brietta, good night. Amen. Uh, found a, a mass, possibly some cancer, so we want to pray that God would touch her. Results are going to be coming up, but we want to pray that the report, amen, that God's report, amen, is the good report, amen. So um, we want to continue to pray for our elders, continue to pray for those that are sick among us, those that just need a touch from God. If you need a touch in your body tonight, come on down, amen. If you can't make it down, raise your hand nice and high, amen. The ministry team will come and find you in the name of Jesus. Let's go ahead and take this faith. And let's lift it up. Let's lift these prayers up to our holy God. Father, we love you, Lord, and we give you the praises, God. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, God, for your goodness, for your mercy, God. Hallelujah, that endures forever, God. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness, God. Hallelujah today, God. We pray, Lord God, that you would just touch our elders today, God, in Jesus' name. God, that you'd bring them strength, God, and healing, Lord God, and all those, God, hallelujah, that have, God, something in their body, God, a need in their life. God, we pray, go forth, show yourself strong, mighty God, in Jesus' name, God. We pray, God, for Brietta, good night, in Jesus' name, God, that you would touch her body and bring her healing, God. So when they check out, God, have that checkup, God, that is completely clean, Lord, we pray for Hector Garcia, God, that you would heal him, God, in the name of Jesus. 
Jesus, hallelujah, touch his body, God, and move upon him, God, in a mighty way, God, for Kelly Renforth, God, we pray that you would touch her back, God, heal it completely, God, in the name of Jesus, God, we pray, hallelujah, God, for Zora Salt, God, we pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, God, that you would just touch her body as well, God, heal her, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, before that surgery, God, we pray, Lord God, for revival, and God, as you would continue to move, God, in this Michiana area, God, and in the Ironwood Church, God, hallelujah, God, touch the hungry, the hurting, and the lost, God, hallelujah, God, move, God, in a mighty way, Lord, we give you the praise, and we give you the glory, Lord, hallelujah.
Everything stays the same. Heaven is waiting for the mention of the name. And the spirit is moving, burning like a flame. The healing of broken by the one we proclaim. Raise it up.
marvelous presence of God in this place tonight. So glad each and every one of you are here. You may be seated. We're going to call for the ushers right now. It's offering time. Let's clap our hands as ushers come forward. This is our tithes and general offering. And again, we welcome each and every one of our guests to the to worship with us at any time at any of the services that are on the screen behind me. You're always welcome to come to those. Glad to have all of you here tonight. And if you want to know what's going on in, with special events in the church, make sure you get the church app so you can look at the calendar and be aware of all of those scheduled dates that are coming up besides the announcements that we have. So trying to get the communication out many different ways. All right, let's take our offering at this time and place it in our hands, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for being able to give into the tithes and offering, Lord. Thank you, God, for your wonderful provision for us, oh God, for taking care of us so well, for your plans, for your ways, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to give tithes and offering back into your storehouse. Bless it, multiply it for your use. Help us, oh God, to reach the Michiana area in a greater way than ever before. Thank you, God, for what you are doing. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Why don't you turn to a neighbor, greet them in Jesus, shake their hand, high five them, let them know that you are happy to see them tonight in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And for those of you who have just sat down, I'm going to invite you to stand with me tonight for the reading of the word. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 5, 
verses 33 through 39. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. And the Bible says this, And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees? But thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they shall fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old if otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new garment agreeeth not with the old. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine would burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottle shall perish. But the new wine must be put into new bottles, and they are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth for new, for he saith the old is better. Amen. Tonight, for the next few moments... I'd like to preach to you from this topic, new wine, new wineskins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come in to lift up and to magnify your name, Jesus. I give you glory and honor and praise and believe that you're going to do great things in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus tonight. Amen. As always, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to address the people of God. Appreciate the ability to be able to be up here and to hopefully tonight deliver to you what I believe uh, the Lord has impressed upon me. Amen? Amen. William Stanley Jr. was an American physicist who was born in Brooklyn, New York. He had 129 patents that covered a wide variety of electric devices. However, in 1913, he patented what we would probably consider his greatest invention, and the only one that we could all probably name. It was an all-steel, vacuum-sealed, had a green exterior on it, and it kept your coffee really, really hot, right? He invented the Stanley Thermos. Okay, anybody under the age of 20 know what this is? I have just described it to you, but before that, did you know what this did? If I were to hand this to you, would you know what this was used for? We have some blank stares. I have some head shakes. I have some blank stares. That's about how it goes in youth class, too, is it's just blank stares sometimes. Okay, everyone that's my age and older, we probably all know what this is, right? It's a Stanley Thermos. I'm not cool enough to have one that is made in the USA, okay? This is a little bit newer, older Stanley Thermos. Um, so he, he invented this Stanley Thermos, and thus the Stanley Bottle Company was formed. For over 100 years, Stanley Thermoses were almost exclusively marketed to blue-collar men. The Stanley Thermos... And it was also almost exclusively used to keep your coffee night nice and hot all day. For a long time, was synonymous with the hardworking, blue-collar men of the last 100 years. Surely you could have found a Stanley Coffee thermos in the steel mills of Pennsylvania, or the coal and trona mines of Wyoming, the assembly lines of Michigan, the ship channel of Houston, the shipyards of New Orleans, the pipelines and the factories, wherever you found a hardworking tradesman, you could probably find a good old-fashioned Stanley Thermos. However, with the decline of blue-collar work, especially after the 2020 pandemic and the coinciding rise of energy drinks, I'm looking at you, young people, the need for a thermos to keep your liquid energy warm has decreased. As a matter of a fact, it was not so long ago in 2020, if you if y'all can imagine, this was Stanley's best-selling product in 2020. In 2021, the company rebranded and repackaged their product, and they came out with the very first ever Stanley Quencher. 
And that became their bestseller in 2021. The Quencher H2O was put out, which became the, the new bestseller. And fast forward just three short years later, and Stanley has become a household name again and has somehow found its way back into relevance in the public eye, grossing over $750 million in 2023. Now, how did this classic item marketed almost exclusively to the blue-collar worker become a trending household name again to the point where on January 3rd, 2024, Stanley, in conjunction with Starbucks, released the limited-time Tumblr, and people were waiting outside of Target overnight to get a pink Stanley Tumblr. I wonder how that happened. Stanley took all of the same great materials that made it a quality coffee thermos. They repurposed those materials and marketed that new product to a new generation. The new cups are still vacuum sealed. They are still made of steel. You can still get, you can actually get a bunch of different colors on these things. Okay, mine is black because I don't like rose pink or hot pink or whatever other color. This is the only like kind of guy color they had. Because they have now marketed them almost exclusively to women. They have changed, they took everything that made this great and they made this great. Yes, there's ice in there. Yes, it's ice cold. Yes, it's the most delicious water you'll ever drink. I don't know why. I don't know why. The difference, however, is they, they still bear the Stanley name. They still bear, if you see this one, if you look real close, it says Stanley since 1913. This one here, it says Stanley. They still bear the name. They just aren't marketed to my parents or my grandparents' generation anymore. In our text, Jesus is asked about his disciples and why they are not fasting. To it, Jesus replies that the children of the bridegroom should not fast while the bridegroom is with them. Jesus then goes on to teach two parables about putting new and old things together. The first teaching Jesus gives is about sewing a piece from a new garment and putting it on an old garment. Jesus tells us that if we do that, the new will be torn and it won't match the old. Any moms in here ever patched your kids or your husband's blue jeans? You ever put a patch on some clothing? Doesn't match, right? Doesn't match. If you look at Gracie's doll that she's carrying around tonight, you'll see a bunch of patches. None of them match. Because when you take something, a new patch, and you put it on the old, it just doesn't quite match. In the next parable, Jesus tells us about new, wines, uh, new wine in old wineskins. We learned that nobody puts new wine in the old wineskins. Now, there is a reason that this is not done. Clearly, our text lets us know that if we do that, then the old wine will cause the wineskin, uh, the new wine will cause the old wineskin to burst. This happens because the wine, as it sits in the, the bottle or the wineskin, it ferments and that releases gases, and that causes the wineskins to expand. The reason that the old wineskins can't contain the new wine is because the old wineskins have already been stretched to their limits. Wineskins are an ancient type of bottle made from leathered animal skins, usually from goats or sheep. So the new unfermented wine is put into the old, already stretched out wine skin. The gases are released and it expands in the container. So the bottles break and their contents spill out. This is the why of behind Jesus saying that you can't put the new wine in the old wine skin. We see a kind of a part of this concept in John 2 and verse 1. Jesus' sort of debut miracle. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, 
what does that have to do with us? Now, I know Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, but if Mary would have been my mother, I would have ended up on the other side of the kitchen. But Mary is unbothered. Jesus says, my hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, she just ignores Jesus, right? Talk about a sermon right there. Mary just ignored Jesus and a miracle happened. So Mary just ignores Jesus and he says, whatever he says to do, do it. So there were six water pots there for uh, the custom of Jewish pur purification, and they contained 20 or 30 gallons each. So Jesus says to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So, that, so they took it to him, and the head waiter tasted the water which had become a wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew so then the head waiter calls to the bridegroom and says, every man serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then you put the bad wine out, but you have kept the good wine until now. So again, Jesus in his debut miracle is to, able to take water and to turn it into wine. I would surmise that the wine that they saved for the back half of the party in the wedding reception was newer because the older tasted better. Jesus is able to turn the water into wine. Not only was he able to turn water into wine, but he was able to turn water into wine that was better than the good stuff that they had served at the party. Better than the good stuff that they had already served at the wedding. So the head waiter confronted the bridegroom and asked why he had saved the best for the end. Jesus had turned water into wine that had properties and taste of the more aged wine. Because in Jesus' kingdom, age doesn't matter. In, in Jesus, the metaphor that I'm going I'm to make right here is that Jesus, the wine, had only been wine for a few seconds. But when it was taken... And the head waiter tested the wine and tasted it to see if it was good to put out for everybody. That newly converted wine that had just only a few seconds ago been water, I hope you see the analogy, is better than something that had stayed for a long period of time and, and maybe taken a long fermenting process or had been locked away in some wine cellar somewhere. I'm not sure. Because in Jesus' kingdom, it, it doesn't matter. The amount of time that you have been wine or the amount of time that you've been in the church has no bearing on what Jesus thinks of your skills and abilities. It is not because you're here longer you get to do it better. It's not because, it's not because you're newer than you have to wait a while. No, Jesus, when, when he turns, when he converts things... He, he makes them better than what we could have ever could come up with or ever imagined. He makes it better than that. Because when Jesus takes you and I, and, and he, I just, I love Paul. I love, I love Paul's conversion story. But more than that, I, I loved how that guy greeted him. I know I reference it a lot. But I, I would probably be weary, and most of us probably would be, if Paul were to show up in our church today. Because this is the same guy who just a few chapters er earlier is consenting to the death of Stephen. He's, he's ravaging the, the newly formed Christian church. And he goes and he goes to that one guy and, and he says, Brother Paul. He greets him as a brother in Christ. Because when Jesus converts things, when you have a Damascus Road conversion experience, it doesn't, there's no program that we can come up with to do it better than what Jesus can. As much as I love everything that we do to try and get people plugged into the kingdom, there's nothing that we can do that is ever as good as Jesus and what he does. We're given a little bit more in the Gospel of Luke than its counterpart in Mark. There's a specific piece of information that it, it kind of addresses, the Lord kind of addresses our human nature. It's a knee-jerk reaction that we all kind of have. Verse 39 says, No man also having drunk old wine straight away desireth for new, for he saith the old is better. 
Our knee-jerk reaction to new things sometimes is to put it back the way it was. For me, from a musician and a vocal standpoint, I've seen it my entire career. Anytime you do a song the first time, it's never as good as it needs to be. But the more you start playing that song and the more you start doing the song, the better it gets. But it's never just perfect right out of the gate. For those of you that were telling me about the mishaps at IBC Live, a premier music Bible college in our movement, in our organization, even they had problems doing something the first time. So our human nature that Jesus sort of shows to us is, is the old is better. The old way is, is better. Let's pair that maybe not with a musical analogy. Let's pair that maybe into a, a business sense or a business world to make this point. Because after 10 years, 90% of new businesses fail. A quote that we attribute to Thomas Edison, the inventor of the lights that you are, are enjoying right now, says something to the effect of, I did not fail 10,000 times. I found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. The point being that often the first time we try something, it will not be the best. And if we aren't careful, our knee-jerk reaction will be what Jesus told us, that just to go back. Just imagine if Thomas Edison would have been like, you know what, 9,999 times is enough. I'm not going to try that last time. And, you know, maybe someone else would have invented the light bulb. But, but if not, we could be sitting here under candlelight. Who knows? Now, growing up, my dad taught us a number of different things. I can remember laying on large pieces of pipe, looking at a watch, waiting to go home while my dad was welding on something at my grandparents' shop. I can remember during these times of learning that us boys, would, we would be given a chance to run, to, to weld or, or to run a grinder. But if you messed up, it's not like anything bad would happen, okay? But if you messed up, let me tell you right now that your next chance of doing that thing got farther away. I can't tell you how many times I messed up welding and I went back to putting a hood on and watching for hours and hours and what seemed like hours and more hours. So there I am. I got to try for like five seconds. All of a sudden, I'm messing up somewhere. A stinger gets taken away. I get moved out the way. And there I am back to watching. You ever seen metal melt? It's not that exciting when you're not doing it. So there I am. Now, we, we learn, sure, but the point that I'm making here in, in humor is, is that we have a knee-jerk reaction to if something is not done the way to our skill level or what we can do, we, we want to just make sure that it gets done right. We have cute little sayings for it, like if you want something done right, you do it yourself. This is a derivative of a saying from Napoleon Bonaparte who said, if you want something done well, do it yourself. Do it yourself. And so that is our knee-jerk reaction of, well, you know, it wasn't, wasn't done exactly. I have, a, I have a saying, it's not famous yet, but, you know, young people, if you want to make it famous on whatever social media platform you use these days. It's a job and it's done, but I'm not sure if it's a job well done. I don't know. You, maybe, I'm not sure. You guys, you guys think about it, come up with something. Because that's our knee-jerk reaction is to just kind of take it back, and, and I can make sure that it gets done the right way. Now, I, I'm, fairly still, I'm still fairly new here, comparatively, but I'd like to think that I've been here long enough to use Bishop Mendenhall as an example. Do you love Bishop and Sister Mendenhall? Yeah. All right, perfect. Because I'm no math magician. I didn't say that wrong. I said it right. Math magician as opposed to mathematician. Okay, I'm, because math is magic to me. I'm no math magician, but if I have my facts straight and I do the math, Bishop Mendenhall retired in 2019 after 65 years of pastoring. Is that accurate? Before the church on Ironwood, it was the church at India, in Indiana Avenue. This building was completed sometime in 1973 or 1974 on the plaque that's in that corner. It says something about April of 1974. So why am I going through this history a little bit tonight? Because the reason is this. If I 
carry all of my numbers right and do the subtracting and the stuff right, retired at 86 in 2019 after 65 years of pastoring. So that means that sometime in 1954, as a 21-year-old man, he began pastoring a church. Do we have any 21-year-olds in the house tonight by a show of hands? We, got a, we have some 21-year-olds. We have some 21-year-olds who have been 21 for a couple of years, okay? That doesn't count. So my hyphen, where are you at? My hyphen, right. Anybody feel like pastoring a church right now? Because, because that's the way that it, it was. We used to be comfortable with putting the kingdom into the hands of young men and women that loved God. But somewhere along the way, we decided that that wasn't appropriate anymore. It was because of the times when I heard a preacher trying to convince the room full of us fellow preachers that the kingdom is in good hands with this new generation that's coming up. And it was a beautiful message and it was a valiant effort. But I wondered to myself, how did we get to a place where we had to have one of Pentecost's foremost orators and teachers convince us that the kingdom of God will move on without us? What kind of arrogance have we slipped into to think that only me and those older than me can carry the gospel or a certain generation is qualified to be used in the kingdom? I loved seeing the two hyphen up here on Wednesday talking on the panel discussion. In fact, I loved seeing the panel discussion up here on Wednesday. Well, that's right. It's different. That's right. But, but we're not preaching to people who want to buy thermoses anymore. The generation that we're trying to reach is not interested in the packaging of a thermos. They need the gospel, yes. They need Jesus, yes. But they're not interested in being sold a thermos. But David, you don't understand. It was a different time back then. They were different back then. The men and women of God were different back then. That's my point. We all agree. But let me tell you this, I would, I would much rather minister in a time where owning a TV with three channels on it was the biggest conversation in church. I'd love to be able to nitpick about the height of some poor sister's beehive hairdo and the style of some poor brother's hair. Oh, how nice it must have been. But I don't know if you've noticed lately, but that's not what's going on around us anymore. It's very 2 Timothy 3.13 out there. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's getting very Isaiah 5 and 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. God did not call, hear me with all the respect in the world that I can muster. God did not call the greats of yesterday to minister then reach today's generation. God did not call Bishop to minister to the LBGTQ community. He called these young people. God did not call greats like G.T. Haywood or G.A. Mangan to minister to today's needs and today's culture and today's sinners. Hear me tonight. We are still people of the Spirit. We still believe in the finished work of Calvary. We still believe that God is one and indivisible. We still believe that God manifests himself in flesh. We still believe in the fivefold ministry. We still believe in holiness. We're trying to be present in a generation. We're trying to present to a generation that will hear the gospel. We're not trying to change doctrine. We're not trying to change the message. We're still people of the name. We still believe in Jesus' name. It may not look like you did when you were coming up, but to be frank, Pentecost did not look like in the second half of the 20th century like it did in the first half of the 20th century. You want to compare? Let's compare some oranges to oranges and some apples to apples tonight. Because Pentecost did not look from 1950 to 2000 like it did from 1901 to 1949. It looked different. And we're at a pivotal point. Because we can keep trying to market the gospel to the Stanley Thermos crowd. And we can be satisfied with the fact that we are keeping it the way that it used to be. 
Because remember, our knee-jerk reaction is to go back to the old way. Or we can take all of those same qualities, all of those same great truths, and we can apply them to the generation that is surrounding us. We're not trying to change anything. We're not going to change the Bible. Listen, I, I get it, I get it, because I can remember being, I was a younger man at one point in time in my life. I know that's revelatory, I know that's profound. I was, at, I was at Bible college, and I was very zealous in my Christology class. And I was so zealous that before people were creating YouTube channels and YouTube content, I was putting stuff on YouTube. It's not there anymore, because that was 15 years ago. And in the internet world, the internet world is like dog ears. It just magnifies by seven. So it was a long time ago. And uh, my friend and I, uh, Andrew Herbst, I think he's still, he teaches at CCS down there at Calvary still or something, way smarter than I am. We, we got so very convinced of the oneness of God, and we got so excited about it that we began taking what we had learned from our Christology class and we began making YouTube videos. As a matter of fact, we were so zealous about it that we stayed up all night making YouTube videos instead of sleeping and then slept the next day during class when we were supposed to be learning. Obviously, we didn't do that in Christology because we were very excited about Christology. This was in 2010. One day, I walk into and I was, they had email back then, young people, okay? They had email. We had an email link attached to our YouTube channel and we got emails. Very exciting. We were very excited. We had 50 views on a YouTube video. Inflation, okay? In these day, in this day and age, it would be like 500 views, okay? Uh, but, you know, it was only 50 back then, but it was 49 more than what we had had previously. So we got emailed by this anonymous pastor from around the area who was a oneness believing person and we begin well first of all my more diplomatic friend began exchanging in conversation with them but me not knowing how gmail worked at the time just responded back to their original message not knowing that they had been in communication already so i responded back to this oneness upci pastor essentially in summary that if he didn't believe in the oneness of god he was a heretic Again, my more diplomatic friend had already been talking to him. So it's this big kerfluffle, it's this big thing, and we get to go talk to Brother Kilman about it, um, who was our Christology teacher, and um, we, we went and talked to him about it. But in this email exchange between this anonymous UPCI oneness pastor, they told us that they weren't sure, they weren't even sure if the Trinitarian belief in how God is one was not accurate. They, they, they had studied and, and they were leaning more towards that it was, that's the triune nature of God is, is how God was made up. So I understand when, when you see and hear things like this, especially in the early from 2000 to 2010, it was a weird time in church history uh, in South Texas, I'm not sure about y'all here, but there seemed to be this sort of wobble because my parents and, and my grandparents' generation, they were, they were sort of getting in the back seat and, and letting more younger people drive the car, and there was, I uh, witnessed in some cases this wobble. And I understand that we see things like that, and our instinct is to correct it. Our knee-jerk reaction is to just put it back the way that it was. Put it, put it how we had it, because when, when we knew how it was, that everything would be fine. Because it's, it's the way that it had been, and it had worked for 50 years. But... Aside from all of that, 
let me just inform you that there's a group of people who are younger than I am that they love the truth. They love the Bible. I talk to them about it a lot. They love the scripture. They love the word. They want to rightly divide the word. But at what point in time in history did we go from being comfortable with a 21-year-old man pastoring a church and building the great church that you see around you to 21-year-olds, nah, we're not so sure about them. I know there's a lot there, okay? The whole, if you've heard me joke about this concept of emerging adulthood, I get it. It's this thing where adulthood in society around you, in case you didn't know, adulthood in society around you is prolonged. And so now there's this category, it's not quite adolescence and it's not quite adulthood, it's somewhere between 19 and 29 that we have these people who are emerging adults. I get it. I get it. But somewhere along the way, we've forgotten the teachings of Jesus. Somewhere along the way, we forgot Jesus, Jesus did not teach his disciples for three years and then send them out to do things after that. As a matter of fact, it's very early on that Jesus commissions his disciples to go and do things in his name. It's very early on in their training. It's very early on. Are they going to make mistakes? Yes. I should have brought a rock because I could have handed it to whoever doesn't have sin so that way they can throw the first stone. Because we all make mistakes. So we're at a pivotal point in the gospel that we have to decide, am I going to take Jesus' name baptism? Am I going to take the oneness of the makeup of God? Am I going to take the man Jesus? Am I going to take holiness? Am I going to keep it to where it's marketable to a generation that's no longer uh, really relevant in the public eye? Or am I going to market it to the new generation? Because everything that you see here is everything that was here, it's just put in a different packaging. It's just put in a different setup. So yes, holiness might look different. I'm not saying biblical holiness, but the way biblical holiness is presented, it might look different. It might be different. The way the Bible is presented to the world, it might be different. But it's not because we hate everything that came before us. It's because we love that. We're just trying to make it to where we can get new people into the presence of God. Because we can celebrate this awesome Stanley Coffee thermos all we want. But we have to get people into the presence of God. And we have to get people into the church. Not this building, but into the bride of Christ, the church. We have to get people saved and in a connected relationship with Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you make it look like. As long as the Bible is the Bible and you stand on the Bible, let me tell you, I, I wish, let me just reiterate, I wish that my biggest problem was TV. Pastor, don't you wish that your biggest problem was TV? But it's not anymore. It's not. And so we have to accommodate and adjust ourselves using the scripture as a foundation to reach a new generation. We, we've got to, because if we don't, guess what? We're gonna, we can go to heaven with our Stanley Thermos and our 250 to 300 other friends carrying our Stanley Thermoses. Off we go into the pearly gates with us and our friends because we refused. Yeah, I know, they're not, you're not going to like the music that they like. I don't like some of the music that they like, okay? You don't like that they're going to wear sneakers with their dress clothes. You're not going to like it. I get it. I understand where you're coming from. And I get to be in the precarious situation of trying to preach to an older generation, being right in the middle. Being a millennial stinks. 
because I'm right in the middle of two generations that are almost separated and at odds with each other. And I'm trying to convince both of you that it's about the Bible. I'm trying to convince both of you that it's about Jesus. It's about Christ and him crucified. I'm trying to convince both of you that there is a lost and a dying world that needs to be saved. So it might not be, but it's always been. Might not look like it's always looked like. The Bible is going to be the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for the dismantling and the deconstruction of biblical holiness principles. I'm not advocating for baptizing in the titles. I'm not advocating that pants are okay for women. I'm not advocating that cutting hair is okay for women. I'm not advocating for any of that. I'm advocating for the fact that we have to market the gospel in a way that reaches a generation. Because if you start with holiness, you've lost. If you start with, but if you start with the Savior, I've got to be done, I've got to quit meddling. If you start with the Savior, if you start with Jesus, if you start teaching those Bible studies, if you start telling people that there was a Savior who died on a cross and loved them, that's where we started. It's a long way to go. I, I say it often, and I'm coming to a close. I'm going to invite the music back to the platform tonight. I say it often. That we're not just reaching, it's not just the good Baptist family down the road anymore. It's not we get them baptized in Jesus' name, show them tongues in the scripture, and they're already pretty much believing in holiness. We just have to, a few things here and there to tweak. It's not that anymore. It's not that anymore. Let me describe to you what the world looks like out there. Think of everything that you love about the church, and it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Everything that you love about this place and these people, it's the exact opposite. In my grandparents' day and age, they had to, they had to think about the repercussions of what happens if we do find out about so-and-so's TV. Six or seven years ago, I referenced my oldest brother a lot, again, because he's smarter than I am. And six, and seven, six or seven years ago, we have this Marco Polo thread, um, this video, it's like video voicemails is, is all it is. And so I was at work one day, and I was driving around Sweetwater County, and there really wasn't much going on, and there really wasn't much to drum up that day because it was, I'm not sure what day of the week it was, but it was boring, so we started talking back and forth on Marco Polo. Because you can see the trajectory of what goes on around us. If you think the world's evil now, just wait till next year. If you think it's bad now, just wait till the year after that. Because evil seducers, they will wax worse and worse. If you think it's bad now, just wait, it'll get even worse. And so I asked him, because my brain, sometimes I just go down rabbit holes and I can get stuck there for a long time. Some of you are saying amen for the last 15 or so minutes of this sermon. I went down a rabbit hole with my oldest brother. I said, what are we gonna do when someone who's already had gender reassignment surgery come to church and get saved? What are we going to do? What, what is a reasonable addressing of the church for that? Do we talk about going and having it reversed? How do you even come up with that? Because unless you've missed something in the last decade, that's all around us. It's everywhere. So, so what are we going to do when those people begin to realize, hey, this didn't fix what I feel in my heart. Maybe I should go give Jesus a try. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? How are you going to respond? Ask yourself that question. Ponder that for the next week or two. What am I going to do when I, found out, when I find out the sister who just got saved isn't a sister? How are we going to address that? And if we're not thinking about that, we need to start thinking about that. Let me tell you right now, you don't, 
For those of you that are going, oh gosh, the kids right now, they're already talking about it in school. They're already did. My kids go to a Christian elementary. They have a no conversation policy. But coming from a public school to a Christian school, that was already being talked about among friends in first grade. So for those of you that are trying to spare the children and petition to not have me preach for a while, God bless you. They're already talking about it. They're already being informed. It's already being put into children's TV shows. We we don't watch shows in my house because that content is in there. Gracie does not understand why she cannot watch Chip and Potato because that content is in there. They're already started. They're already there. So, yeah, we have a lot that we have to talk about. We have a lot that this generation is facing, but God did not call the greats for such a time as this. He did not call T.W. Barnes for today. He did not call Anthony Mangan for today. He did not call the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ himself today. He did not call Paul for today. He did not call Peter for today. He did not call John for today. He he didn't call any of those men for today. He called the young people that are sitting up at the front of this row for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Because this is, they're, they're not the church. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. And just in case you don't like that, your pastor whispered that just before I said it. So if you don't like it, don't talk to me about it. I mean, you can, but see earlier story about Bible college. We're in a pivotal moment in church where we can choose to stay as sticks in the mud and to refuse to reach a new generation. Or we can say, let's take this same great gospel, let's take this same great Jesus, let's take this same great Holy Ghost, and let's put it in a way that reaches people. Because I don't know about you, but my purpose in this life is not to come here and to give you a nice message that makes you feel good about yourself. My purpose in this life is to see lost souls saved. Your purpose in this life is to see lost souls saved. I know I've gone too long and I beg your forgiveness. I'm fixing to close. I'm gonna invite you all to stand with me tonight. Because at some point in time, we have to be comfortable with handing it to the next generation. We have to be comfortable with some 21 year old pastors We have to be comfortable with some 21-year-old worship leaders and some 21-year-old leaders in the church. As a matter of fact, it was the beloved Bishop Mendenhall who said, the one thing that's constant is change. You can find that in his interview covering his 65-year celebration here on WSBT 22, just in case you're wondering. So the one thing that's constant It's change. The gospel doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. But the way that we reach for people can change because we're not married to the process. We're married to the vision. We're not married to how the gospel spread. We're married to the gospel. We're not married to how we get it outside of these four walls. We're married to getting it outside of these four walls. open up these altars in just a few minutes. But I want you to be sensitive just for the next few moments to the Holy Ghost. And elder, if you're in here and you have something that you can you can say to a young person, I'm going to encourage you to do that. Parent, if you're in here and you want to pray with your kids, I encourage you to do that. Because this isn't As a guy stuck in the middle of two generations that aren't really fans of each other, let me me remind you that it, it takes all of us. It takes all of us. 
It takes all the, the body, I can't say is the hand that I want to be the foot, and the foot can't say to the hand that I, I want to be the hand. You are here for such a time as this as well. So if you have wisdom that you can drop on a young person, I encourage you to do that. If you have a word that you can drop on a young person, I encourage you to do that. If you feel led to pray for a young person or a hyphen person, then I encourage you to do that today. Because it takes a church, it takes all of us to reach the world. No single one of us can do it all by ourselves. But when we all pull together and when we all work together, we do all of these things for the kingdom. I'm going to open up these altars. You are invited to come to these altars right now. As you come, I would encourage you to begin to pray. But if he can use anything, God, I want you to use me. If you can do anything through me, God, I want you to do it in me. In the name of Jesus.
Jesus is. 